Hey y'all, and welcome back to another episode of Cause of Death. I'm your host, the Appalachian Sun. Today we're going to talk about why you should get punched in the face if you shout out Freebird at a concert. Blunt force trauma. <laughs> Trying to do this without reading. And the impending doom of the self-proclaimed Mississippi kid, Ronnie Van Zant. Roll that. Roll that intro. On October 19, 1977, Ronnie Van Zant would front the original iteration of Leonard Skinner for the last time. Actually, it was about a half a mile up the road from where we're sitting at what was formerly known as the Greenville Memorial Auditorium. They tore it down in 1997 to um, build the what I grew up going to is the Bilo Center, but it's now known as the Bon Secures Wellness Arena. A sad thing is the space where the old Memorial Auditorium used to be is a completely vacant lot. I walked out there the other day and just stood there because it is, it's a place of very musical, historic relevance. Ronnie Van Zant sang Free Bird, Sweet Home Alabama, That Smell, all of these songs in this place for the last time. So this story is deep. There's a lot of stuff on it. There's a motion picture film. There's a lot of players because, yes, it's another plane crash, and I'm sorry to bring another plane crash to the channel after already having done two, but this hit very close to home because it all of this happened right up the street. I live by the airport where they flew out of for the last time, and during my time as a, a cremationist working in the funeral home, I would sit down with families doing the arrangement and, and you always ask at the end, you know, before burial or cremation or anything, does the loved one, does your loved one have any sort of uh, last will or religious thing that they might want to do? You know, I would be happy to say a prayer, burn a candle. And sometimes, yep, families would want you to burn a candle or say a prayer. But here in the South, and I can't exaggerate this for this story, um, more often than not, I would have people ask me to play Simple Man or Free Bird. I've, I've played these two songs hundreds of times before pushing someone's loved one into um, the cremation retort or God's big oven, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, to the point of where I know these songs down to the time of like pushing the person in and pressing the cremation button for the solo of Free Bird. And... And I've done this so many times, like I, I have I emotionally struggle listening to these songs that Ronnie Van Zant made up in his head. He never wrote anything down and just like basically freestyled over some amazing guitars. Like they're all young guys just making stuff and didn't expect it to be this big. But it's so big that it's people's like last wish for their loved ones in this plane to hear this music. And that's why I'm doing this story. Okay, before we get too deep into this, let's identify a few key players because in our previous uh, talks about plane crashes, there were no survivors. Whereas here in the Leonard Skinner plane crash, there were 22 survivors. So, or 24, 22, 24 survivors, which were bandmates and members of the road crew, sound management, that sort of thing. And so all of these people who survive going through a very traumatic experience, brain injuries and all of those things, the story kind of becomes a bowl of spaghetti after a while and they all kind of circle around each other. And then if you listen to interviews with these people throughout the past 45 years or so since, since the plane crash, like some of the stories have changed. And so what I'm trying to do today is identify the, the main themes, the main players, and kind of put them together to see if we can't get some sort of very truthful timeline. So there's Gene Odom, and he's one of my favorite people of this whole thing. He was Ronnie Van Zant's childhood friend growing up, and uh, Ronnie hired him as security. Uh, as I understand, Gene was drafted into the Army, and so by the time he got back from Vietnam, Vietnam, depending on how you would prefer to say it, 
I guess he was a tough son of a bitch. So Ronnie Van Zant called the guy, was, and he didn't do drugs is the other thing. So Ronnie Van Zant hired Gene Odom to pretty much babysit the band, help them get off of the drugs they were on, and he also knew that he could trust this guy with his life. And they're great. They're great. Gene Odom has interviews and a whole YouTube channel, and the stories he has, he's amazing. He's just an old Southern guy, and like I com he's completely trustworthy to me. Just he reminds me of people who are in my family, just a good old boy. And I feel like none of his, I'm sorry, he's just a good old boy. And I feel like listening to interviews of him for years, his story does not change. It is always the same. Currently, we only have Gary Rosington and uh, Artemis Pyle of the original Leonard Skinner, and they don't speak. Gary Rosington isn't out in the open talking about the plane crash. Uh, and then Artemis Pyle, which I actually got to see him for my birthday. It was, it was amazing. He's 70 something years old. He's still killing the drums. The show was amazing. It was emotional because I just saw it after doing all of this research. However, he's made a full length motion picture and he's one of the characters where I mean, okay, he's a Marine veteran, and as a veteran brother, like, I want to trust him with my life, of course, but, like, his story does change over the years from the plane crash to now. But his part in the plane crash, where he's a Marine veteran, his dad died in a plane crash, he finds himself in a plane crash as a qualified pilot, as the, uh, F, um, the FAA report says that he was a qualified pilot, um, so he survives this plane crash, right? But he manages to get himself free of the wreckage and find a farm and get help and, and get recovery before the plane crash. There's also Ron Eckerman. I believe he was he, the manager for Leonard Skinner. He wrote a book. He's one of the people he blames himself for the plane crash because he uh, leased the plane. And then there's literally the entire road crew, and you can go listen to all of their interviews on the YouTube. And I, I have to talk with my hand today because I got a lot of comments. Hey, son, it sounds like you're reading this stuff from a script, and I was. This all centers around the impending doom of Ronnie Van Zandt. From a young age, he told his dad, family, wife, other bandmates, Artemis Powell confirms this story. But from a young age, for most of his life, Ronnie Van Zant told everyone, like to the point of where they were tired of hearing it, that he wasn't gonna live past the age of 29. His dad asked him why, and he told him, I don't know, that's just my limit. Secondly, there's a song on the first album called Mississippi Kid, and this is confirmed by Jojo Billingsley in an interview that Ronnie Van Zant would refer to himself as the Mississippi Kid. However, he had absolutely zero ties to the state of Mississippi, uh, except for he would ultimately die there. Also deceased in the plane crash were Steve and Cassie Gaines, brother and sister. Cassie Gaines was one of the honkettes, one of the backup singers. She had left Oklahoma and went to Nashville, powerful woman to make a life for herself, landed a gig in Leonard Skinner. And later on, she got her brother, uh, Steve Gaines, a uh, gig playing guitar in Leonard Skinner. And we know that Street Survivors album, the guitars got a lot better. And in one of the interviews I saw with Gene Odom, he was in the studio and uh, he saw Steve Gaines like laying down his tracks and he said he looked over at Alan Collins and Gary Rosington and said, this guy's going to make you fuckers clean up your shit. <laughs> Man, you got to go watch some Gene Odom. Hang in with Gene Odom. That's the channel. You got to do it. Unfortunately, Dean Kilpatrick, he was the assistant rogue manager. He would get the band everything they needed. So I'm assuming this meant drugs, women, and hotel rooms. Uh, Lightheartedly, I'm, they were set, they were a rock star band in the '70s, and if you see the movie Street Survivors by Artemis Pyle, like he he will say that hey, that's what it was like in the '70s. And then also the two pilots would meet their demise in this plane crash. So the plane, I know I got really in detailed into the aircrafts in the previous videos, but 
we're going to talk about other causes of death here. This is about Ronnie Van Zant, Stephen Cassie Gaines, Dean Kilpatrick, and the two pilots. This isn't about the aircraft, but the aircraft is a very important part. It was a, it was built in the 40s. Here it is, 1977. Somehow they got it. They, it was converted into like an air tour bus. It was a, a dual uh, propeller plane, so it had propellers on each engine. But it was well past its prime, like literally to check the fuel, the pilot had to like dip a stick deep down into the thing and like pull it out, see, see how wet it was. <laughs> That's how much fuel they had. And it's also confirmed that this exact plane, the um, managers for Aerosmith were going to buy this plane for Aerosmith. But they show up and the pilot, co-pilot are drinking, smoking, joking. Uh, and it, they looked at the plane, just the condition of it, and they said no. However, some good old boys from the South who just came up being rock and roll stars, like any sort of aircraft would be a step up. We're going to take it because I would certainly be, you know, I would certainly have that attitude as well. So they're making the flight from Jacksonville to Greenville on this Convair by propeller plane on October 19th for the show in Greenville, South Carolina that evening and a giant fireball shoots out the back. So this, if the condition of the plane didn't already have people, I keep leaning over the mic, I'm sorry. If the condition of the plane didn't already have people on edge, rocketing this giant fireball out of the engine certainly did. But they make it to Greenville. They play a killer show. From what I've heard, the Freebird closer was 20 minutes and it was absolutely epic. Um... They stayed in Greenville that night and they had the 20th, the day off, and they were supposed to get the plane fixed. However, due to money and just like trying to make things work, they couldn't, someone wasn't going to pay for the mechanic to fly to Greenville from Texas. But the next show was supposed to be in Baton Rouge, Louisiana from Greenville, so they were going to have the mechanic meet there. The plane, it shot a fireball, but the pilots thought it would be serviceable enough to get from Greenville to Baton Rouge, get it fixed there, and then they would continue on. However, this is where the blame game starts happening. Gene Odom says that he went to the airport here in Greenville on October 20th and was talking to the pilots saying, hey, you know, whatever we got to do, we don't need to be on this plane get it fixed, and, and, you know, we'll move on from there. So they had the day off on October 20th. So if you were of partying age and you saw Leonard Skinner in Greenville, South Carolina on October 19th, 1977, please, we got to know your story in the comments. Where did they stay? Did they stay at the Poinsett Hotel? That's the only one I could think was downtown close enough to the thing. What I do know is on the 20th, Okay, so what I do know is on the 19th, they had hired a funeral home, so it was either Thomas McAfee or Mackey, which are the two premier funeral homes in Greenville that have been here for 100 years. So they hired one of the funeral homes as limo drivers from the old Greenville Memorial Auditorium to go to the hotel. So these hooligans did something to piss off the funeral home. So the next morning when they're supposed to fly or get picked up to go to the airport to fly out, the funeral home wouldn't come pick them up. So they all had to get, they all had to get cabs and get to the airport. During this time though, Artemis Pyle, the drummer of the band, lived about 45 minutes north of Greenville, north west of Greenville going toward Asheville in a place called Campobello. So he says after the show, he went home to his wife. And then the rest of the band just stayed downtown partying. So this is where the blame game starts happening when everyone's loading on to the flight because Artemis Pyle was 45 minutes late getting to the plane, driving in from Campobello, and they had like an auxiliary engine running. So the pilots definitely should have rechecked the fuel before they took off, but they didn't. Um... So the blame game starts happening when Artemis Pyle is late for the airplane. Also, the blame game is Ron Eckerman on himself blaming himself for get, getting a shitty plane. 
And then it's Gene Odom against the pilots for being incompetent and trying to fly this jalopy in the first place. Those are all the fingers pointing in each other's direction. Because it was daylight when they took off, they weren't they weren't going to be, see the engine rocket a fireball. At least the pilots assured Gene Odom that because it was daylight, passengers wouldn't see the engine shoot a fireball. So they're on the plane, they're in the air, they've left Greenville, South Carolina, on the way to Baton Rouge. Gene Odom says that Ronnie Van Zant had been up all night, tooting it up. JoJo Billingsley had been kicked out of the band because of her drug use, and she somehow knew their, uh, everybody stayed under an alias in the hotel room and they all went to Robert E. Lee High School. So Alan Collins' alias was Robert E. Lee. So JoJo Billingsley had been kicked out of the band and she knew their aliases. So she called all the hotels in Greenville until she found Robert E. Lee and got through to the hotel room trying to get her job back. So apparently this pissed off Ronnie Van Zant, and they were just up all night arguing you know, this, that, the other thing. And the next day before the flight, he had asked one of the other backup singers for some sleeping pills so he could get some rest before the show in Baton Rouge. They were also arguing about the condition of the plane. It's known for sure that Cassie Gaines had purchased a commercial ticket to fly from Greenville to Baton Rouge because she didn't want to get on the plane. It was either that or she wanted to hide in the equipment truck and other people were on board of not wanting to get back on this plane. But it's infamously known, there's a quote, um, and the quote is incomplete, where in this all-night argument where they're tooting it up and fighting over stuff, uh, Ronnie Van Zant says, if the Lord wants you to die on this plane, when it's your time, it's your time. We got a show to do. And that's the happy part of the quote, but it doesn't end there, or you're fired, was the, was the just of the rest of it. The plane was set up, there was kind of a couch in the front, like a kitchen, some regular plane seats, and then in the back, like there was a table where you'll see infamous pictures of them playing poker with each other. Apparently that's what they did the most during the flights. Um, but in the front, there was a couch, and it had kind of like a little table, basically, and Gary Rosington and Alan Collins were both sitting on the couch. Gene Odom says he put Ronnie Van Zant in the floor just in front of the couch so he could lay down and get some sleep before the show. In the Artemis Pyle story, however, Ronnie Van Zant isn't out on sleeping pills. Now, if we know the story of Ronnie Van Zant being out on sleeping pills and this whole situation happens, that's not super rock star, so like I can appreciate Artemis Pyle's recollection that Ronnie Van Zant, the plane's going down and he's like shaking hands and all that stuff. Like that's how I want to remember it too. I don't want I wouldn't want to remember my friend like being asleep, knocked out on sleeping pills, and then he never, you know, saw the next day. So we're gonna just like cut the blame game off right there. We're gonna enjoy the movie. We're gonna have that movie as a semi-positive mental picture. And so here's the real story. The engine dies. Then the other engine dies. And they're trying to turn around and get to a place called Macomb, but this big plane, no propulsion, slowing down, like they, there's no chance. So they see a farm where they think they can make an emergency landing. However, just due to the sheer weight of the plane, and this is another part of the blame game, they're rock stars in the 70s, so they had all kinds of stuff. The plane being overweight is another like finger pointed in the direction of somebody. The plane starts going down. And everyone, it's, it gives me chills thinking about everyone's description in their interviews talking about how they could hear the pine trees brushing underneath the plane and then like what sounded like thousands of people just assaulting the plane with baseball bats. So during this time, the plane's going down, we have Gene Odom who goes to the pilots and says, I hope you sons of bitches live through this so I can kill you. 
And his story is that he goes back and he's trying to get Ronnie Van Zant up out of the floor onto the couch and buckle him in. But Ronnie Van Zant's out on sleeping pills. And if any of us know the history of this man, he's very hot tempered and he'll fight fight you in a heartbeat because that's how he got arrested so many times for just standing up for himself. Because he wanted to be a boxer before he was a singer. Uh, so I guess when he got when he got you know lit, that's what he became. So Gene Odom, you know, tries as a friend to get him up out of the floor, and he's like, "Man, quit fucking with me." And so Gene Odom says he kicks him in the ribs. But now the plane is in a nosedive. He says he gets him. Ronnie wrestled into the into the seat. And he says he gets him fastened in and starts running toward his seat, but it's too late. The plane breaks in half for Gene Odom, and he's sucked out the bottom. And one of the, and the, the stories I've heard, Gene Odom is one of the only people thrown out of the plane, except for the pilots, uh, because he was running halfway and was at that point where the plane broke in half. So the second timeline during this whole situation is Artemis Pyle. Artemis Pyle's story is that he goes to the pilots, sees the look of fear in their face, and then he starts making a stewardess trip up and down the thing, making sure everybody's buckled in and, you know, shaking hands with Ronnie Van Zant. Of course, if you survive a traumatic experience, like your memory of it's going to be what you need it to be to be men mentally okay. So I can understand that. Uh, but the accounts of other people about Artemis Pyle is that his dad had died in a plane crash, and now here he is on a plane that's going down. So the story of Artemis Pyle is that he went all the way to the back of the plane because he knew that you're more likely to survive if you're in the tail end of the plane. So the story conflicts there that, you know, he's making a stewardess trip trying to get people fastened in. He might have done that on his way to sit in the back of the plane, which I don't blame him for that either because he happened to survive the plane crash get himself out, and get to the farm and get help. But to all of our misfortune, the mighty pine forest in Gillsburg, Mississippi, would claim the lives of Ronnie Van Zant, Steve Gaines, Cassie Gaines, Dean Kilpatrick, as well as the two pilots. And I've spent months researching this, and it's just torn me up. Brother and sister... Ronnie Van Zant, who had written the songs that I've played hundreds of times for all of these people uh, during their cremations. And it's so weird. That year, 1977, Elvis had passed away just a few months before the plane crash. Uh, and Ronnie Van Zant and Cassie Gaines were both only 29 years old. Steve Gaines was a little younger than Cat. He was 27 or 28. He was 28 because he wasn't in the 27 club. But, you know, this turned me on to the, there's a 29 club. So uh, Hank Williams Sr. was also 29 when he died on the road. And this dying on the road thing, that's what Ronnie Van Zant told Artemis Pyle once in Japan, that he was going to go out with his boots on and die on the road. And... And I think that might be the motivation for this channel. Is we're looking at, so far, these plane crashes. And it doesn't end there. It's just dying on the road. We're all going to meet a demise at some point. And the interest in this is, you know, what did you have in your pockets your last day on Earth? Like, what, what did you do your last day? What was the, you know, all of these things. And that's, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to remember these legendary people, not by their legend, but you know, by their humanness. And I listened to so many interviews that I've was I I felt like in my in my dreams I was on the plane, just looking around, looking for truth in all of these tales of different people. But we can't change the past. And of course, you know, Ronnie Van Zant's younger brother has gone on to front Leonard Skinner and Gary Rossington is still in the band. 
um, Artemis Pyle tours around with a band out of Asheville, North Carolina, and they play a uh, tribute to Ronnie Van Zant, which is all Skinnered music. It, and it's amazing. Uh, my wife and I went for my birthday, like I mentioned earlier, and, and it was wonderful. But I don't know why it's tearing me up so bad. I think maybe it's the brother and sister, Steve and Cassie Gaines, um, dying together on a plane and, and then going to a funeral home and being cremated one after another and then being interred in Jacksonville, Florida, next to their friend Ronnie Van Zant. Of course, since then, other original band members, such as Leon Wilkinson, the bassist, Alan Collins, who had a, a tragic timeline here on Earth, um, Billy Powell, the keyboard player, piano player, the backup singers, Leslie Hawkins and JoJo Billingsley. Of course, here now, Ronnie Van Zant, Steve Gaines, Cassie Gaines, and all we have is Artemis Pyle and Gary Rosington and music that everybody, everybody loves. I heard a story and he was like, I'm in a cab in Thailand and Sweet Home Alabama comes on in the cab. And he said, he asked the cab driver, you know the song? And he's like, at the time, the cab driver turns around and says, turn it up. And that's that reach to think that these words and these sounds came out of these dudes from Jacksonville and reached all of these parts of the world. It's tremendous. I like to throw in a moment of comic relief during these dark, heavy moments uh, in this conversation. So Artemis Pyle gets to the Moat Farm, gets help. One of the first guys on the scene, the first guy to dig a hatchet into the metal of this airplane and pry it open. His name was Dwayne, or his name is Dwayne Easley. He's still with us. And I trust the words of these guys too. Good old farm boys from Mississippi who grew up going to church and hunting, you know, just living a good old fashioned life. Like I trust all of their words. But the comic relief comes from Dwayne Easley, who was just working on his farm one day, and then the next minute he's at a plane crash in the in the woods behind his farm, trying to help people save their lives. So he he digs his hatchet into the side of the plane, and like pries the metal back, and he says he looks in and looks around, and he was like, "What's a bunch of hippies doing on an airplane?" Because <laughs> all of the he's like everybody had long hair. He said you couldn't tell who was a who was a man or a woman, and all the hippie paraphernalia, you know, clothes and belts and tassels and stuff around. And I don't know why I thought that was funny, but like to show up to a horrific scene, and the way you you s calm yourself to get through what you need to do is to ask yourself what's a bunch of hippies doing on an airplane before you climb in and cut everyone's seatbelt and bring them out one by one and, and get them to a hospital. And they overloaded the hospital. People had to be flown out all over uh, and they had to spend months to years. Hell, the ones who are still with us have never recovered from this and, and in any of the interviews I've read or listened to, it's something that they think about every day. If you're interested in cemetery tourism, Ronnie Van Zant is buried at the Riverside Memorial Park in Jacksonville, Florida with his family. This is his second resting place. He was uh, originally buried with um, Steve and Cassie Gaines. Uh, Steve and Cassie were cremated and, and interred beside a, a kind of a mausoleum with Ronnie Van Zant. However, like 10 years ago, some assholes decided to break into the tomb of Ronnie Van Zant, they pulled his coffin out. It doesn't appear that they got into it, uh, but then they also broke into the columbarium of Steve Gaines, and it was obvious that they took the bag of cremated remains out of the urn and ripped it trying to get it back in. So whatever these people were doing trying to break into these cemetery vaults, shame on you, and I hope your asshole falls out. Though they didn't meet their demise on the airplane crash, Leon Wilkinson, Alan Collins, Billy Powell, as well as Leonard Skinner that the band is named after, they're also buried in uh, Riverside Memorial Park where Ronnie Van Zant is buried. And what's really interesting is 
uh, if you're standing at Ronnie Van Zant's grave, Billy Powell is over here and Leon Wilkinson is over here and Alan Collins is, you know, they're, they're buried in the situation where they, they would be standing in on stage and that's super heartwarming. Stephen Cassie Gaines are interred at the Jacksonville Memory Gardens. So there's the Riverside Memorial Park where you'll find Ronnie Van Zant, Leon Wilkinson, Alan Collins, Billy Powell, and Leonard Skinner. And at the Jacksonville Memory Gardens, you'll find Cassie Gaines as well as Steve Gaines. And and it's really a really nice little little plot under a tree for them. And the um, there's a bench, and it also has the information of their parents there. So it, it's it's really sweet. I'm I'm gonna look at a note real quick. Dean Kilpatrick, if you're interested is buried at the Arlington Park Cemetery in Jacksonville. The information for the pilots is available on Find a Grave if you're interested, but at this point, being three videos into topics about plane crashes, I know all of you are hating on some pilots right now, so <laughs> we're just gonna omit that information and hate them because they are just doing a shitty job for money. Another interesting tidbit I found researching this is that Ronnie Van Zant is buried with a cane fishing pole and his iconic black hat. And there's a lot of stories that say, you know, he was decapitated or, you know, had a closed casket because, you know, he was really destroyed in the plane crash. But that's not the case. His wife has said many times that he simply looked like he was sleeping. Uh, Blunt force trauma happens by just basically he got hit in the head with something that caused enough force to shock his brain into stopping. And that's just highly unfortunate because they're on this plane and when it crashed into the trees, you know, objects in motion stay in motion. So if you weren't buckled in or things it's really the things that were on the plane because most people were buckled in it's the things on the plane that all went flying forward that caused the damage so this would also you know be the cause of death for everyone and in the last video we talked about exsanguination and bleeding out and there's other stories you'll hear billy powell say that he saw cassie Gaines bleeding out and he was holding her in his arms but he would come out years later and say that that wasn't true so it's really, what can we believe? And that boils down to trying to piece through all of these stories from people who experience something horrendously traumatic. So with that said, whatever you got close to you, whatever you're drinking, this is for uh, the free bird. I'm a tequila guy. So um, uh, let's see. I'm leaving this game one step ahead of you. And you'll not hear me cry, because I do not sing the blues. Well, fly on, free bird. Listen to Skinner. Fuck, I told my wife, crying the other day, like, if I die, I need you to play Tuesday's Gone. Which, simple man, free bird at, at funerals, and then thinking about Tuesday's Gone... I, I wasn't aware of this, but September 11th, 2001, when the Trade Centers fell, it was a Tuesday, and millions of people found comfort in Tuesdays Gone. And, and not just that, Curtis Lowe, my grandparents owned a honky-tonk, and so when I was a kid, <laughs> barely old enough to do anything, these guys would come in with duct tape shoes and old guitars and sit around and play and I would just be there and I mean that's why there's a whole wall of guitars behind me and this is what I do so yeah let's listen to some Skinner tell me your stories tell me let's talk about how much the music from this band means to all of us in the comments I appreciate all of you up until this point sharing all of your stories in the Patsy Klein video someone said that they had come across like a suitcase that had her stage clothes in it. That's so cool. Like, I need to know all your stories. Let's talk about Skinner. Let's keep it respectful. 
because that's what we're about here is respectfully remembering these people that we care about. So until next time, time waits for no man. I realize now that I'm the asshole who didn't tell you why you should get punched in the face should, should you yell out Freebird at a concert, and it's simply out of respect uh, for the people who've chosen that as their end-of-life song, for the people who are on stage performing. And uh, Ronnie Van Zant said in an interview that he didn't want to fight, but if you disrespected him, his family, his band, um, he even shook a guy on stage just before Gene Odom threw him off, of course, uh, telling him to get his own show. So, should you feel the need to yell out Freebird, either get your own show, or I'm assuming, and I feel like I know, that Ronnie Van Zant would want you punched in the face. So, with that said, check out the uh, Spotify playlist, The Appalachian Sun, uh, Leonard Skinner's last set list that happened here in Greenville, South Carolina, and um, yeah, subscribe, or don't. I'll see you in the next video. Cheers. Mm -hmm.